Kayla, Leanne, and Megan are the fiercely feminist authors behind the brand new cookbook, Recipes to Take Down the Patriarchy, the Feminist Cookbook. Kayla is a yoga teacher and writer, Leanne is a social worker and freelance writer, and Megan runs the podcast Faith and Feminism, and she is also a writer whose first book, Women Rising, is slated to come out in spring 2021. Recipes to Take Down the Patriarchy is not your typical cookbook, as the headline reads, This cookbook is about going on a journey to reclaim the kitchen, cultivate community, and smash the patriarchy one recipe at a time. With its unique perspective and social justice take, this cookbook has proven to be a hit with people from all over the world who love and support its powerful message. Please welcome the authors of Recipes to Take Down the Patriarchy, the Feminist Cookbook, Kayla, Megan, and Leanne, to the hot seat. I do want to thank you guys for all being here in the hot seat today. I really appreciate it. So the first thing I actually would like to do is just have you guys all introduce yourself in the role that you played in creating this cookbook. My name is Megan. I actually had a dream about two years ago now. In the dream, I made a cookbook called Recipes to Take Down the Patriarchy. So I wrote it down in like my half awake state. And a couple of weeks later, I brought it to these lovely ladies and I said, hey, do we want to bring this dream to life? And they were on board. In this process, my primary role was curating recipes and um, matching them with women. So I did all of the initial research on the women uh, to match them with a certain recipe, looking at their demographics, where they came from, what they may have enjoyed. And I want to be clear, a lot of these recipes came from other sources, other people created them and I curated them and we, we often amended them but we were not the original creators of the recipes. I, I did research on all of these women. I felt like a lot of people hadn't heard of, like the Mirabelle sisters, Sophie Scholl, uh, Patsy Mink, and tried to do the best to honor their culture and where they came from and create a recipe that they would enjoy. And of course, some of these women are vegan, so that I'd find a vegan recipe. That is basically what I did. I curated recipes and researched women to match them to honor their legacy. My name is Leanne Blackwood. My main role is to market the cookbook, market our brand of recipes to take down the patriarchy. And I want to add, because Leanne did not talk about most of the photography, I think 90% mm -hmm. of the photos taken in the cookbook are actually Leanne's incredible photography. I love photography. I have always really been interested in like lifestyle portraits. And then this time around, I got to get into food photography, which was super fun. And um, I learned a lot from, there's an um, Instagram and YouTube account named Joni Simon, and she's like an amazing food photographer. So I've been like taking tips from her, stuff like that, to like learn the ins and outs food photography and also I did design the layout of the book which mm -hmm. I've never done a book design before but I did design the book so I'm very proud of it and I'm Kayla Carnes and my primary role in our project was um, budgeting and accounting and logistics I played a pretty big role at the beginning when we were trying to figure out how much money we needed to fundraise to make the project possible. And it ended up being, you know, like however many thousands of dollars and then figuring out where the funds needed to be allocated, the number of things we needed to order um, and kind of how everything would come together. And so how we could package our reward system when we launched our Kickstarter so that eventually all of the funds would come in and we would be able to pay for everything that we needed to bring the cookbook to life. And thank you again for being in the hot seat today. So I'm going to go ahead and jump right into it. The name of the book is Recipes to Take Down the Patriarchy, the Feminist's Cookbook. For those who may not know, patriarchy refers to a system or government in which men hold the power and women are largely excluded from it. How do you all define uh, feminism and what are some of the ways that you think everyone can help to dismantle the patriarchy? This is a great question. Patriarchy is this, this system in which men hold power and women don't hold power and women are viewed as less than human, um, allows them to be exploited. And if we're looking at the world as a whole, we live in a very patriarchal world. There is not a country that you can go to where women are not viewed as less than men and endure more violence than men. And um, you know, some of the Nordic countries may have gotten really close to equalizing even like the pay gap or maybe maternity leave. But for the most part, most countries are really far behind, including the United States, in terms of seeing women um, in positions of power, positions of government, being paid equally, um, having the same access to healthcare or as quality healthcare as men do. Um, and so that also increases for people 
Um, if we're talking about intersectional feminism, which I think is so important because I think in the, uh, you know, you, you go to the 1920s when the suffragettes were trying to get the right to vote, they threw black women under the bus. They said, literally, you're going to march at the back of this because we don't think we can get our rights to vote because you're black. And so we're going to elevate our whiteness to get proximity to power. And so I think that's a huge flaw of white feminism is we didn't care about the flourishing of our black brothers and sisters, or this could be said for basically anyone on the margins. This could be for Native American people. This could be for Asian American, um, even people uh, who are queer. Like there's just, it's concerned about their own flourishing and not necessarily the flourishing of others. And so, um, it's really important that when we talk about patriarchy, we also talk about racism and all these other factors that come mm -hmm. into play. Um, because patriarchy and racism, they go hand in hand. We see this over and over and over again. And so we really need to address that. But basically my concept of patriarchy, it's men being in charge, women being viewed as less than. And if we are familiar with what causes abuse, um, so many studies are coming out recently that sexual assault, this is not about sexual urges, like women have sexual urges, but if you look at a society where one in three women are the, survivor, or the survivors of assault, whether or not that's domestic or sexual assault, or one in five, between one in five and one in six are the survivors of rape, we need to be asking questions about why is it that there's so much male violence towards women and even male violence towards other males? What gender scripts do we have? What mm -hmm. power systems are in play that enable this? And so for me, taking down patriarchy is taking down the gender roles, the gender scripts, the power differentials that allow people to be abused. And so of course, when we're talking about if we're taking race into that, it's the power differential of elevating whites above people of color. Um, and if we're talking about gender, we're talking about putting white uh, cis men above everyone else. And so for me, taking down the patriarchy, it's creating a world and a society where women aren't viewed as less than, that queer people aren't viewed as less than, and that we can all focus on the flourishing of all people. What's really important to me too, um, when you talk about feminism, is what Megan was saying about intersectional and making sure that your feminism is intersectional. Um, because like, even as a black woman, like it's so easy to kind of like center like my culture and my like, you know, ethnic background as like, oh, we need to solve this and do this. And don't get me wrong, we definitely have a lot of work to do when it comes to supporting black women, supporting black men, um, supporting black queer people, you know, there are a lot of injustices that still need to be um, dealt with and reckoned with, but I do think like it is important to look outside of myself. And so when we say intersectional, we mean intersectional. That means ability, gender, um, sexual orientation, like any across any all of the spectrums and just really recognizing that historically white cis men um, are the top of the pyramid so to speak and so it's like we need to recognize that these marginalized groups of people um, we're not getting the same like access to whether it's like education health care um, any number of things. There's a lot of work to be done and when it comes to like those different spheres. Well, I guess when I think of patriarchy, I really think of just like all the different ways that it just seeps in and then so insidious into our lives. Um, even like specifically when we talk about sexual violence, I think because we um, are just now like this, the whole story of Sarah Everard um, in England has been blowing up and rightly so because like every woman deserves to feel safe like getting home. Like that's that's like a no, like no brainer, but that's not the case. And it's not the case for a lot of our, um, you know, trans sisters and trans like family, like family and community. It's not that way. It's not the way for black women or indigenous women who go missing all the time. And so it's, there's so much in what, like what patriarchy does and something too, because I'm running our social media accounts. We run into a lot of trolls who are like, well, are you saying that like, you know, men can't be abused and all that stuff. And that is not what we're saying. Feminism is not the hatred of men. Feminism is the hatred of patriarchy and the systems that uphold white supremacy. Yeah. And so basically when we say like we hate patriarchy, it's it's saying we want to take down those systems that are also harmful to men. They're, it's not, it's to their detriment as well. It's not saying like, oh, you don't have issues or struggles. Like, yes, men get sexually assaulted. Yes, men are also the um, survivors of violent crimes. Um, 
but we have to look at like what is what is causing that and when you look at the core of it where it's it's i mean it's other men it's like kind of fueling the flame so we have to like be honest and and say like we're not fighting against each other here we're not we're all in this together and I think if that's if one thing that um specifically men um people who identify as men can like take away is like this is not against you it's against the systems we have to acknowledge our role in that because we all play a role in patriarchy it's not just men so the only other thing that I would add to that I echo everything that Megan and Leanne said but I think that there's a misconception with feminism that it means men are the standard and men are not the standard. Men never have been the standard. Um, the standard is equality for all human beings and for the flourishing of all people, whatever that looks like, whatever body you're in, whatever skin color you have, wherever you come from, wherever you're going, we all deserve dignity and equal treatment across the board. Creating any book, but especially a cookbook seems like a very time consuming task. What was the process like of researching recipes and influential women for the book and getting photography and promoting it? Um, what I loved about researching these women, yes, it was time consuming, but it was also incredibly inspiring to read about these women and what they've overcome and like, whoa, I'm not alone. It seems like this story of, of, of women has been pushing for our rights, overcoming injustice, surviving oppression. Like there's so many different women who have overcome so much and made a difference. And so for me, reading about their stories, knowing that it could be possible and doing my small part to remind all of us that these women exist, that they did succeed in so many ways and that we could even eat in their honor, create a recipe in their honor and know that we're not alone. I think so often women, people in general, not just women, feel alone. They feel like mm -hmm. no one really understands what I've gone through or my struggle, or I feel like I can't make a difference or that my voice doesn't matter. There's so many factors at play that tells us that we don't matter, right? That our voice, that our experience, that doesn't matter. But what I found through reading about these women is that our experience absolutely does matter. And what's happened to them, what's been happening to women for centuries, for millennia, is not, it's not necessarily new what I'm experiencing today. Um, it might look different, but it's still the same roots and it's still the sign, the, the still kind of the courage to push back against this. And, and a lot of these times, these women were, were pushing against um, extremes far more than I've gone against, right? So um, you think of like, for example, there's, we talk about Ella Baker. She was an incredible civil rights activist. What she had, that she had to push through was a lot more than what I've, I've had to push through. But at the same time, knowing that she could overcome makes me feel like I can overcome. Yeah, it was time consuming, um, but it was also really inspiring. And I also want to be clear that um, I didn't write all of the biographies for these women. I got I did the initial research phase, like, hey, we're gonna focus on this woman and we're gonna do this recipe. But when it came to writing the cookbook, we actually all split up the bios. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, when we got together on Saturdays to cook, we cooked like, I don't know, maybe like eight recipes, yeah. which is a lot, including Hours. meat courses and desserts inside. So it was like making a Thanksgiving meal like every yep. two weeks and our feet hurt and we were exhausted. It was certainly time consuming. Like I echo everything Megan was saying about just like it, how much work it did take. And um, like I said, I've always loved photography. So the cool thing about it was like, it wasn't just work. I got to learn so many new skills and it was definitely time consuming, just like learning like angles and researching like, oh, how can we like really light up this drink so people can really see like what it looks like and get excited to, to make it. It was a lot of work, but it was so fun. This has been, for me personally, I don't know like if you guys would feel the same way about this, but one of the biggest lessons that I've learned is that it, it is so much better to do something with other people than to try to do everything on your own. Mm -hmm. And that I have a tendency to just kind of want to rely fully on myself and think, you know, I could do this and I don't need to delegate. I could, you know, figure it all out. And this project, I mean, not only did I not come up with it, but no part of it would have been what it is if it wasn't for the three of us working cohesively together. And my favorite part has just been seeing the way that in moments of failure, like of out 
outright failure. Like something you might not know is our first Kickstarter failed, like hard, failed hard. We had to do it twice. And like in moments of failure, there's like one of us like coming along to like pick the other person up and like keep us going. And then when that person trips and falls or when something comes up that feels like incomprehensible, the other person comes along and we pick up that one and we keep on going. And it's not any one of us that did any part of this on our own. It was the three of us coming together, using our strengths, using our weaknesses. And it was like the perfect marriage of our personalities and the gifts that God's given us to use. You know, it's funny that you brought that up, Kayla. I'm going to skip ahead because um, going off of what you said, I was going to ask you guys, you all used Kickstarter to help finance this book and it really worked out for you. I was going to say, what was that process like? And were you surprised by the outpouring of support that you received on Kickstarter? But you said that your first one actually failed. That was like the thing that I, like I said at the beginning, that I managed the, for the most part, like in this project, the fundraising and the budgeting and the project, like the Kickstarter. So we knew right from the get-go from our first team meeting that this was not something that we could do without financial support support of other people. It was going to be hundreds and, you know, hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars, depending on how big we wanted the project to be and how full of integrity, you know, with good photography and, and good research. And the, it took a year and a half to birth the cookbook. So that was a lot of time and emotional labor on our part. We were going to need finances. And so we launched a Kickstarter and I believe, I, how long was it into the Kickstarter before COVID hit you guys? Do you guys remember? Like, Did we start like in? It was like two weeks. It was yeah. like a matter of weeks, and February. we had hyped it. We had hyped it up. We had done all this research. We had our whole budget laid out, all of our reward tiers, and we had posted about it. And people were giving, and we had a couple thousand dollars raised. And then COVID hit, and then we had people start pulling their pledges, and people were losing their jobs, and you know, losing their savings accounts. And you know what that's like. Everybody listening knows in some way that profound impact that it had financially and emotionally on your life. And we got together, and we just decided we are not comfortable asking people who are struggling which is everybody for financial support so we're going to put the project on hold and the kickstarter ran out and what happens with kickstarter if you don't reach the full amount it's all or nothing so the thousands of dollars that we had raised were all forfeited and when we decided to give the project a second wind and to relaunch the kickstarter with new rewards a new financial goal and asking new people to support us we were starting from page one, you know, ground zero. We didn't have anything that second go around. We had to rebuild it back up. And we were fully funded um, within a matter of, was it like days? It was like 40 something hours, like not it was even two 40, days. Yeah, it wasn't even like days. It was like 48 hours, like a little, maybe a little more than that. And we since have raised almost double the initial amount that we had set out to raise. So we went from losing all of our funding, you know, and having like a two month goal to raising thousands and thousands of dollars in 48 hours. And the majority of people that gave, correct me if I'm wrong, but were not people that we knew or knew well. And they were different also from the people who had given the first go around. So there were people that had heard about us and who were moved by our mission, moved by our community outreach and moved by the passion that we had for telling these stories who just went all in. And oftentimes we didn't even have to ask people to give. They would hear about us or we would share the story and they would be the ones to make the decision. There wasn't very much asking. And that organic process of just seeing people not only become emotionally invested but also financially and like physically invested in the project was like the seal at least for me that said this is holy work this is good work not only do I believe it and we believe it but other people believe it too and they're willing to put skin in the game I'm glad that it ended up working out for you guys they say don't do business with friends because it can get messy uh, ladies <laughs> But you ladies appear to have remained good friends throughout this process. How did you all meet and become friends? And what was it like to work on such a substantial project with friends? Were there ever any disagreements? At the time, we all lived in Athens when we started. It's a college town outside of Atlanta. Oh. I gathered a group of women together who were creative, like who I knew were writers or photographers or something. I was like, I just felt as myself as an entrepreneur, someone who worked independently, that I needed some support, someone to bounce ideas off of. Um, it went really well at first, and then we slowly just started losing people. But we were the three, you know, the three core people. So of course, when I had 
this idea, I knew not only that we all shared the same values, mm -hmm. um, but we also were very creative people. I wanted to work with my friends because I liked spending time with them. I had been warned in the past about this, this idea of like, don't work with your friends. And for the, we haven't had any fights. We have had to have conversations like, hey, like I'm carrying most of the load in this area. I need help. So I feel like we all have different times where we were like the strong ones that carried this project. And there were times where we had to have conversations like, hey, guys, um, I'm feeling kind of overlooked here. Can you help me here? And so what we would do is we like, we're so sorry. You're right. You have been carrying a lot in this area. So let me try and help and work with you. Because we're friends, we can have conversations like that. And so I still highly recommend it. I feel like I've been learning how to be more confrontational which isn't a bad word confrontational is really good because sometimes you have to say like things that you need mm -hmm. and I have to say like I feel like I can be as honest as I need to with these two and I could be like hey this isn't working for me I need some I need something else or I need you to do this or I need whatever so I feel like it is like sometimes yeah it can be touch and go when you work with your friends but I think too like this was such a labor of love that it was like we knew what the greater purpose of it was. And also like we had a shared vision. And so, yeah, I think honestly, like it's, it was, I don't know if I could have done this without <laughs> doing with my friends and these two specifically, so. We've been in this project now for about a year and a half. And the majority of the time that the three of us have spent together over that last year, because this project has been so big and taken up so much time, has been like with each other, but working on this. And so something that my husband said to me a little while back was like, I think you guys just like really need to prioritize spending time with each other just to be together like as friends like you used to do and not always just have the times that you're together be when you're working or problem solving and so I don't even know that I've ever like even articulated that to you guys but that definitely made me more conscientious of that and we do spend a lot of time together um, outside of our project um, and that's been really really awesome and I think that that's a big part at least I mean correct me if I'm wrong but why it's been able to be sustained like well, that's not the only time we see each other like we're really like we have a very integrated friend group where like the three of us are um you know in it with a bunch of other people that we know and love and like we celebrate birthdays together and like book launches together and dog birthdays and all that other stuff so that's not the only time that like we're vulnerable and committed with each other like we really nurture our friendship outside of the boundaries of our project and I think that our relationship would be very different and probably a lot more tense if that was not the case have you faced any backlash for releasing a feminist cookbook because unfortunately we all know that a lot of people hear the word feminist and associate it with man-hating or other negative stereotypes mm -hmm. oh my goodness yes yes yeah. Yes. Um, I would just like to say <laughs> that when you Google recipes to take out the patriarchy, which I do often because as a person who's kind of like spearheading marketing, I'm like, okay, what kind of like press is out there about us or who, what, who's talking about us or where, like, if you search us, what comes up? And there is a, some like post of this person, like at, when we first started our Kickstarter, I don't know if you all know this, but when we first started our Kickstarter, somebody screenshot our Kickstarter and was like making fun of us for our vision of, um, of smashing the patriarchy by like reclaiming the kitchen. People, people are, people get butt hurt because of the word feminism. The type of work that we're trying to do and the type of feminism that we are, we believe in. Um, yeah, it's not, it's not what people are thinking it is. We have faced backlash and I think it really just like continues to prove our point mm -hmm. of why we need feminism. Just yesterday we had some guy, some like white, like way jacked up guy comments, repeal the 19th, which is the right that gave women the right to vote. In addition to saying something about how Donald Trump treated women how they deserved or something like that. I deleted it because sometimes you can tell when someone's gonna listen and someone's not. And so this guy literally thought that women shouldn't have the right to vote, which I think is truly insane that anyone would think that like that you think that women are not capable right. of making a decision of who should be in power. Like 
who are you? And then of course, another white guy liked it. And I went to his, I'm like, who are these guys? Like, who <laughs> thinks this? So I go to their profile and one is like the guy that clearly has um, some insecurities and tries to make up with like physical brawn. And so like all of his pictures are like him, like lifting weights and <laughs> whatever. And which it shows you these scripts of mass, like this is our whole point. Like the script that you're given that the only way you feel secure is to, number one, tear down women. And then secondly, to jack up your own body. This is a harmful masculinity script that you have received and you're not happy or you would not be go trolling a bunch of women. But the other guy was like, he had Bible verses all over his page who apparently doesn't think women should have the right to vote, which is something I am sadly far too familiar with in the church, which is why I'm trying to reclaim it, yeah. uh, feminism for the church. But anyways, I just think it's so interesting to look at, hey, you think you're benefiting from these masculinity yep. scripts that you have, but it's very clear to me that you are insecure, that you're a bully, and that you're trying to find yourself acceptable by punishing your body. I also get it on my own personal accounts. And this guy this morning commented, I was shared statistics of women's abuse. Like I shared earlier, one in three women in the United States is the survivor of assault, one in between one and five and one in six, which those numbers are probably higher because a lot of women don't come forward about being raped, um, are the survivor of rape or attempted rape. And this guy is like, why don't you talk about how women abuse men? <laughs> I was like, because statistically, this is not the problem. Statistically. And he's like, well, it's my experience. And I said, well, it's my experience to be sexually assaulted. Like, this doesn't, like, I'm not invalidating yeah. your experience. I am talking about the why. Again, we're talking about systems. What contributes to a society in which sexual assault and domestic violence is such an issue? And it has so much to do with the way men and women are raised. Men are raised to be dominant, powerful, you know, their only acceptable emotion is anger. And so they oftentimes have a lot of mental health issues because they're not allowed to express anything that normal people experience and express where women are raised to be submissive and quiet and beautiful and seen not heard. And our purpose is to serve the men in our lives. And of course that's not helpful either. And so this whole framework of patriarchy isn't serving men and it isn't serving women. Mm -hmm. So it's not putting women above men, it's putting them on the place where they're allowed to exist as they are and not as they should be. And I have definitely had some really hard, hurtful conversations with some of the people closest to me where they have literally said, you know, I can't support it. And it comes from a misunderstanding of, and after, you know, like talking to um, who these people are, and I was actually really, really grateful that somebody that had this conversation with me that I'm referencing, they circled back and they asked for forgiveness and they said that they felt like they were wrong, but that the perception of feminism that they had that caused them to make these statements, like, I can't support you. I don't support you. I don't believe in this. I don't want anything to do with it came from a misunderstanding of what feminism is and what we talked about at the very beginning was it's not men versus women. It's not him versus her or them versus them. It's just equality and integrity and respect for all human beings everywhere all the time. And we're all feminists, but feminists, feminism is a word that's been radicalized. And there's a lot of words in the political and religious spectrum that have become very dogmatic, but that doesn't take away the inherent truth of what they are, the foundation that's been laid of what it actually is and the work that needs to be done to build on top of these ideals. And so in a way, I do think that we're reclaiming what feminism is um, through doing this and education is our platform. So it's I, I welcome that. And I think Megan and Leanne do too. I, I welcome the opportunity to educate people. We all have biases in one way or another, even the people who have done the most work. And so it's a journey. And this book is not asking people to say, okay, I read the book. I've done the thing. I cooked the chili. I read about the woman. I've arrived. <laughs> it is an invitation to get on the path to, to justice. Some people are here to, to troll and you don't need to engage delete or delete and block is a great way to deal with that. <laughs> Since we are talking about a cookbook, cooking and feminism, I need to bring up the restaurant industry, which I worked in. And I find that it is one of the most misogynistic places that I've ever worked in. Mm -hmm. It is also a very racist place, one of the most racist places I've ever worked in. And so my question is, I find it interesting that cooking is considered something feminine 
something feminine that housewives do when we are younger. But once we get older and place those cooking skills into, into a professional money-making setting, you find that chefs running those kitchens are mostly white men. So why mm -hmm. do you guys think that that is? Patriarchy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Privilege, patriarchy. I am so sick and tired of women's talents and interests being weaponized against them and being used for their oppression. So right. I think we, as children, often innately know what we love and what we're good at. And then if that is not something that the system of patriarchy says is beneficial to the people in power, then it's like beat out of us, literally or figuratively. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry if that was crass, but then, you know, you move into your adolescence and you move into your adulthood and it's like, if you can't monetize it in the way that we want you to do it, if you can't dress the way we want you to dress while you do it, if you can't get this job in this demographic, in this geo geographic area, then it's not worth anything. And I, um, I'm, I'm sick of that. And I had to be almost 30 years old before I started realizing that the things that I love can be done, not they don't have to be done well, or they don't have to be done for anybody else. Like you can just do something as a woman because you love it. And sometimes just showing up and existing in a space unapologetically is an incredible act of resistance. Even if you're not actively perpetuating any kind of an agenda, just embodying yourself and embodying what you love is a powerful, powerful act. And I think there's also uh, an, an element that we haven't talked about, about capitalism and greed. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. how that also goes hand in hand with patriarchy and racism and protecting wealth and giving it to those who are already, if we're talking, um, Isabel Wilkerson is an incredible uh, journalist, author, um, a scholar who talks about how the United States is not necessarily a racist society, we're a caste society. And if we're talking about these different tiers, again, we talked about white straight men at the top of that tier and it goes down. And those are, those are the people that have the most power. They give that power to one another. It's like a bros club. Um, instead of empowering those or hearing the voices of people below. And when I think about restaurant workers who get paid next to nothing, I think this is also a symptom of racism, classism, patriarchy, capitalism, where it keeps the people at the top with their power and it keeps people below. And it's a system that's set up and designed that way. And so a lot of people say the system is broken, but the system, um, I've heard a lot of anti-racism educators say, the system is working as how it was designed. It was right. designed yeah. to keep white men on top and that's right. how it's functioning. And it's disgusting. And the mm -hmm. sexism and the sexual harassment and all of this other stuff that they deal with is like, but you have to smile because you need the tip, right? So like, how do you push back against that? Because you're in a system where in order to survive, you have to placate their racism or sexism or whatever it is. There's a, another uh, quote or something that says, God give me the confidence of a mediocre white man. Oh, yeah. Which is like <laughs> so true. Women, even if we're skilled, are always told to think less of ourselves. And men, even if they're not skilled, are also told they can fix all of the problems. I love that quote, actually. I have it in my yeah. phone. Um, give me the confidence of a mediocre white man. Because <laughs> yeah. we've all seen that pretty much on a daily basis. So I think that's very, very true. What is your favorite recipe from the book? Oh my gosh. My favorite one to eat is strawberry cake. I love strawberry cake. And so that's my favorite to eat. It's my favorite flavor. Not my favorite to make, but probably the most challenging and kind of fun to learn, even though I epically failed at it, was the eggs benedict, dropping the eggs into the yeah. boiling water, because it was actually so difficult. My favorite drink was a caipirina, which is like three things. It's like ice, sugar, and rum, and like a lime. It's but, actually cachaça. Um, is it a cachaça? Yeah, well, no, it's called a caipirina, but the alcohol is cachaça, not rum. Oh. Oh, it's a go. Brazilian liquor. And this is what it looks like. And every oh, time I go over to Megan's house, Dustin makes me one. And then there was also this delicious dish. And I'm an opportunist vegan slash vegetarian. And so we have several dishes that are plant-based. But we had Egyptian koshari. I believe that's how you say it. Koshari had lentils and pasta and beans and rice and like legumes. And oh, it was so delicious. And you pile it up in this like big like popcorn bowl and you put like crunchy onions on it. And then you just feast. It was <laughs> incredible. And I'd never had it before. Mm -hmm. And it was like, where has this been all my life? I would make it every week. But my favorite, I think, um, to eat and make, I'll say both at the same time, was these vegan potstickers because it, 
took something, like I said, that seemed impossible and they were so good. They're so good. Like I could eat those all day long. When will the book officially be released and where can people buy it? That is a fantastic question. <laughs> Um, okay, so the book is actually out. Um, mm -hmm. The book can be purchased on our website right now. Um, we are recipes to take down the patriarchy.com. Uh, so if you type in, if you just Google search it, it comes up, which is lovely. Um, so if you follow us on our Instagram at recipes to take down the patriarchy, we will give you all the updates you need to know if you want to buy a cookbook. And also we are having a, a book launch coming up um, on April 3rd. And it's gonna be held via Zoom, which will be really fun because we're gonna like just see everybody. And even though we can't all be physically together because of safety and COVID, we want to still have that um, community aspect. So it'll be at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on again, April 3rd. We'll have a little bit of a Q&A and talk a little bit more about the book for people who don't know. Um, and also have a few cool prizes so people can win some nice like RTTDTP merch. What day that you say that was on and where can you watch it? Okay, so the um, the eventbrite.com is where we're where people can buy or register. Tickets are free, so all people have to do is go on to Eventbrite. I will definitely share the link with you. So if people want to join us on April third um, at four p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, we will be live and just on Zoom. It'll be super fun. Is there anything else that in, any of you would like to share? Women can do anything. Yes. I don't know if you're allowed to like swear on this channel, but you can, yes. do effing, you can do fucking anything. And like, like Megan said, if you can bake a strawberry cake, you can take down the patriarchy. And I'm so incredibly grateful for the sisterhood that I have with Leanne and Megan and this sisterhood and this community that we've cultivated through our work at Recipes. Because I think for so many women, myself included, this is giving us a space to find out what our voice is and a platform to use our voice and to realize that we are strong and powerful, but not just on an individual basis. When we come together, we can do literally anything. And we couldn't have done this without any one person in this project, but I know specifically for myself, I am a better woman and friend and advocate just because I know these two women. And I'm so excited for everybody to get their hands on this book because I know when they encounter it, they're going to be made better too. Just thank you for having us. You asked great questions. We felt seen and heard and valued. So thank you for taking the time. It was an honor to be here. And we, yeah, just thank you so much for seeing us and just believing in this work um, and having us on here. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I do want to thank you guys again for being on the hot seat today. I know that everyone is really busy. I know it's not some people's thing to be on camera. So I do want to thank you all again. Thank you, Bianca. Thank you so You're welcome. It was a pleasure to meet all of you. Thank so you, Bianca. You. you guys have a great day. You too. Bye. Thank you.